thank you so much for being willing to share your story. Um, this whole this whole platform was really created to give people a voice. Um, so I'm really excited to hear your story again because I remember the first time it took us by surprise. Um, mm, yeah. Uh, yeah. That we ended up talking about it. Yeah. But I was really blown away by it. So. Oh. Um, so let's go back to the, the kind of the early days when you were younger. Yeah. Um, what was it like growing up um, as a child and what were your first kind of memories as a youngster? Okay, so, well, I have vivid memories of being very, very young. Mm. And the first one must have been um, just after I was born and yeah. I was in hospital in the little incubator and I had the little... Um, name tag thing but it was on my left ankle and then mm. someone came and gave me an injection in my foot in my heel of my foot mm. and that was really horrible but I was sort of really I remember feeling really conscious of everything yeah rather than sort of it being a, a baby look at that you know mm. um so that was one memory and then there was another memory sitting in my nana's front garden in Leeds I was born in Bradford mm. um, and just the and I was sitting on this goatskin rug and the she had this lavender hedge and it was a sunny day and these two sort of must have been neighbours with a pretty little baby and and I was just under one then mm. so that was so those are my two earliest yeah early memories but there's a lot I don't remember yeah and then um, when was it really that um, things started to change within your family? Well, I think um, it was always going to be a drama because mm. on the day that my mother was due to give birth to me, she ran away yeah. um, under the deluded idea that she wouldn't have to go through with labour. Mm. My mother was a very troubled soul, I would, I guess, yeah. um, and had, you know, loads of problems with with drugs so she'd been taking drugs all the way through the pregnancy and then so as soon as I was born I was ill and I was on the radar of mm. the social services and um and I was only with them for my parents for about three months yeah and then I was put into foster care sorry there's a cat um oh, hello <laughs> I was put into foster care and then I was in a children's home mm. and then my grandparents my mother's parents got guardianship of me and I came down to London to Walthamstow when I mm. was 18 months old yeah so that was sort of that was the trajectory and then I was with them so and I grew up with my grandparents yeah did you know did you have an awareness of what was happening and why are you were with yeah. your grandparents I don't know if I did at the time um I think um you know I was always aware that my you know my mother was my mother and yeah. you know the relationship was encouraged mm. I'm not sure that that was the best thing really because she she did sort of continue on that path yeah. you know um and that that is you know, difficult to have witnessed growing up. Yeah. But um, And of course for a, a, a mother as well, because a child is always close to their mother. Yeah, yeah. So to see yeah. that happening. Yeah. But then I never really had that closeness with her. She was mm. sort of this, you know, she, she had a, you know, she was a very interesting person. She was very creative. Mm. And I get my creativity massively from her yeah she was very into counterculture and you know the lord of the rings and alternate realities and all mm. of these things and I think you know she she dabbled in that but it it dragged her under you know the current yeah. of that exploration just took her you know she went and lived in India she disappeared for years on end mm. you know there was always sort of you know, there, there's not much. When I look back at my relationship with her, I never called her mother or mum. I called yeah. her Susan, but there wasn't. Um, it was like she was an imposition on my yeah. peace of mind. You know, and although I, you know, she was kind of like this pre-Raphaelite little f pixie of a person. You know, yeah. she was she was adored by members of the family. Um, 
I, you know, I, and I always sort of thought that she was a bit magical and special. Everyone built her up to be this very special person. Mm. Actually, when she would turn up and she would behave really badly and be off her head, yeah. it was, it was traumatising, you yeah. know, as a child. Yeah. Um, and then just to always be told, you know, she's your mother, but not feel like she's my mother mm. and not really understanding what that relationship really is. Yeah. It sort of, it built in quite a lot of guilt. I think I've had a lot of guilt because I was meant to feel a certain way and then I didn't feel a certain way. And, yeah. you know, a lot of people, I felt very pressured to adore her when mm. actually I was angry, you know, yeah. I think. And what does that mean for you? Because you're growing up at a very vulnerable age, mm. going through this and feeling guilt. And did you have anybody to talk to about it at the time? No, not at all. I, I um, have always been a very forceful personality, I think. Mm. Always been a strong personality. And my way of dealing with it was to be really annoying outside of the house. Yeah. You know, so I was bit of a tear away I was very naughty at school sounds like a lot of teenagers yeah you know <laughs> or the, the reputation that teenagers yeah have, have yeah. you know I was I was militant really in my mm. the way that I would do things for example I went to a very you know it's a very culturally diverse area of the world yeah um the east end of London Walthamstow in particular it, it still is now um and I went to a very di you know diverse school you know there were so many different colors and religions and mm. so on but it was a girls school and I you know at the age of about 13 I had a shaved head mm. and I had loads of piercings I got my nose pierced mm. three times not once and I got in trouble because you know you're not allowed to have piercings but you know a lot of the Asian girls had nose yeah. piercings so I went on a whole thing of you are infringing my human rights. Yeah. And I decided to have a sit-in outside of the head teacher's office. And on my own, I didn't bring other people into this. Yeah. It was it was like me. There was this sort of perception of fairness yeah. and what is right that I think, because I grew up in this really strange family situation, mm. you know, I lived with my, my grandmother had died, but my granddad and then my aunt and her husband, who was an Egyptian Muslim, had moved in. Yeah. And then my great aunt was very much involved and she was a Seventh-day Adventist. So there was this really strange mm. sort of family unit. And I was told that I had to call my aunt, my mum and my uncle, my dad. So there was this thing of things not being real. Yeah. So when I was outside of the home and I could have autonomy over what I was doing, yeah. I chose to be really like this is not right, yeah. fairness and whatever, because I think I felt so, that it was so unfair yeah. in my family life, you know, so. That was probably your way of trying to rebalance it slightly. Probably, And yeah. say, you know, yeah. my home life is yeah. not quite what, what maybe yeah. it should be or quite where I'd like it to be, so. Yeah, I think so. And there were no, even though I was a ward of court till I was 18, there were no, once my nan died, there were no social workers, there was no one looking in and making sure that I was okay. And actually my aunt was a very, she was a very difficult character. I would, I would say yeah. looking back that she was actually very abusive. Mm. And, you know, I think that was where that anger was. Yeah. You know, that it was, you know, my my understanding of it now, looking back to then, was that, um, you know, um, I'm losing my train of thought here. Yeah. Sorry. Um, that I was lucky to have someone yeah. who wanted to be my mother, but then quite often there was a lot of physical and emotional violence, yeah. you know. So it was very, you know, I I really struggled with a lot of that, yeah. you know, that kind of like overcoming that, yeah. you know, and I've had to find, you know, I have to strategize to, to you know, navigate quite a lot of situations growing up, Yeah, you know. I think everyone does, but I think particularly if you've been, if you've grown up in care and there have been a lot of abusive elements in that care. Yeah. It, it becomes, you have to, you go into survival a lot, which is where that anger was. It was, I was yeah. acting out and I was, you know, taking some kind of 
control of a situation because I had no control. As a child, you have no control. Yeah. And you have no awareness that... And you're reliant on the people that, yeah. that are around you. Yeah. yeah. And you only know, you only have that example of parenting or care that they show you. And if that's an mm. abusive care or a neglectful care or whatever it is, those lessons are learned very, you know, they're very difficult to get rid of as you grow older. Yeah. You know, so... So uh, with with your mum um, using substances when you were born, mm. were you always, as a youngster, struggling with that yourself? Because, of course, it's going into your system as well. Mm. Well, I was ill for a long time. I think I've always had sort of... I think your immune system, which, you know, is formed... Obviously, you're formed... Developing You know, you're time. developing, but mm. it's very much, you know, um, it's really important, you know, to to not be taking heroin when you're pregnant with a child, which she chose to do yeah. or didn't choose to do. I don't think once you go past a certain point, choice doesn't come into it, yeah. which I understand now. Um, it was just something like I was always aware that she'd done it. Um, I think now, you know, I have lo like issues with autoimmune things yeah. now. And I think that probably, and I've had that all my life, but mm. it's, you know not diagnosed not sort of I didn't really look at it yeah I have spoken to my doctor and she she's very dismissive she doesn't believe that mm. having gone through that as a an unborn child and then you know that that's actually going to make any kind of difference but I think actually I think it you does. know, it, it, you there, know. It's, there's a lot to be said for you, you yeah. know your body and mm. you know when you um, live in balance with yourself I think your your body can communicate to you so yeah. I've, I've yeah I think so and I think that you know so much of you know you're you're a whole person and you need mm. to be in balance and I think when you've had so much trauma as a child mm. that you you know the body holds that somehow and mm. I think if your immune system comes from your gut there's all this stuff about gut health now mm. it's horrible way like your gut yeah. health <laughs> but um I do know that now you know I, I've I've frameworked my life in a certain way yeah to support myself mm. and I understand you know I've you know for whatever reason I'm a, a very like deep thinker about things and I've worked you know I've read a lot I felt I owed it to myself to come to some kind of place of understanding mm. And forgiveness, you know, and, you know, I'm not angry in the way that I was, thank goodness, as yeah. I was when I was young. But, um, you know, to, I felt like I owed it to myself to live the best life that I could for me. Yeah. Regardless of all of the stuff that happened. Because you do have, you know, if you've been through those things, um, a, a lot of children of parents who have, alcohol or you know drug issues mm. end up perpetuating that story as well yeah and I think if you grow you know if you're born and your primary message that you're given is that you are unloved yeah you you do a lot of stuff that proves that to yourself yeah so I have to have sort of moments where I really question is this the best thing for me? Am I mm. am I showing myself my value here? And and I know you know between you know a certain certain phases in my life that that very negative behaviour has really come out. Yeah, and it is a struggle. And I can completely understand how my mother couldn't get out of the you know the puddle of mm. addiction and and all of that. You know because it's you know it takes a lot to yeah turn away from that and walk away from it because it's you know it's a, a physiological thing I think addiction it's not just yeah. emotional and of course you know. it affects it, it's got such a big effect on mm. not just the person going through it but yeah. all the people surrounding that absolutely you know so what uh what I find amazing about you and of course I knew you first as dressmaker Tara mm, yeah um so then to hear that you have this whole background mm. you've always seemed to me to have a really good understanding of yourself and mm. a very good um balance um kind of emotionally and mm. and the way that you have taken something like that and turned it into something that's so amazing with the dressmaking yeah how did that kind of come about and what part does that yeah. play to you well i th i mean i do actually think that um my 
creative streak that presents itself in this way with with cloth and making clothes and things out of fabric mm. I think it's a very it's, it's a very multi-layered thing yeah because it's a very um it's an inbuilt thing in me anyway because when my relatives have done my especially on my father's side we're descended from Huguenot silk weavers so mm -hmm. you know you can track so back kind of yeah. There already, yeah and then in every sort of you know every generation tracking back there are tailors embroiderers you know weavers and so on so it's almost mm -hmm. like this real like I have a genetic propensity for it I think that's mm -hmm. one thing um even though I would say that my you know there are a lot of very difficult and dark elements in my childhood. Mm. One thing that was a real bright light, well, there were two things. I was loud animals. I had, there were lots of animals, so that was great. Hence the cats now. Hence the cats. Yeah. Um, but also, I come from a family. They are very creative. You know, mm. my mother was an, a great artist. She was great at embroidery and things. My aunt always was dressmaking. So the thing that I was allowed to do, yeah. amazingly enough, was to be sewing and making things. Mm. And so from the age of six, I was sitting at a sewing machine making stuff. Mm. And actually, I think it's, it was almost because my aunt enjoyed it. If I was doing that, I was conforming and somehow it would create a, a quiet space, you know. Yeah. But I was just massively into it. And I used to go to the library and look at all the history of fashion books. Um, if, you know, I just naturally had this desire and this need to... Mm to be touching fabric and doing things with fabric. And Walthamstow Market was full of fabric stalls and yeah. so on, and you could make everything. And we didn't have much money, so it was, you know, you would go and buy one of those patterns with all the little bits, you could do a whole wardrobe mm. and sit there and make stuff. So so I, I that was, um, I think, really a, like a saving grace. I think having that, the ability to sew and make I have found yeah. it a therapy yeah um, but it was a long time before I realized that I could do it as a that it could be the thing that I do to make a living mm. I saw it more as a craft thing that you did on the side yeah and then my mother died and you know one of the things she said to me was you know actually make a choice about something that you want to do because mm. otherwise it just all goes past yeah and you know you you end up regretting so much so actually think about what you want to do mm. and I um you know it was just like completely clear in my head I want to go and do fashion mm. like I've I've been sort of frittering along and doing stuff and partying and I'd been homeless and I just sort of had all these amazing experiences and mm. seen you know every kind of human behavior in life there is which is brilliant yeah but I think um you know i I just suddenly had this eureka, right, I'm going to go and do fashion. So mm. I went and did it and that was that. It's quite um, poignant actually as well because that was one of the last things that your mum said to you. Yeah. So yeah. it's almost despite mm. the fact that she wasn't able to be there for you as much yeah. as she probably would have wanted. Yeah. Now she's in everything you're doing yeah. because she kind of helped you to make that decision yeah. and guide yeah. that. And I think even in her sort of the mess that her life had been mm. in so many ways, there was a level of wisdom there that she did understand, you mm. know. Um, and she, because she had been very creative, I mean, and the good thing is at the end of her life, you know, even though she was very ill, she had she had really re-engaged with her creativity. Yeah. And she'd even had an exhibition at the Leeds Museum of her because she did these embroidered hats that were mm. all quite abstract and sculptural and she'd had this little moment of you know success I think yeah. that which is really which nice. is lovely you yeah. know so I have very happy memories of that and that that I do think that the the human need to create or do things whether it's you know through you know what I do or it's painting or it's mm. you know gardening or you know whatever it is it kind of connects you to some kind of higher purpose yeah and I, I think you don't really feel alone you feel like you're putting something really good out into the world yeah you know which kind of saves gives you something you. positive to put yourself into and to yeah. almost define yourself with really because yeah. it's it's you and it's who you are yeah and it's something absolutely. you can focus on you know and I think a, a quote that I love from um the artist Louis Louise Bourgeois Bourgeois mm. 
she said that sewing is an act of emotional repair, mm. which is why she used so many textiles and did so much sewing in her artwork. And yeah. she didn't see the difference between art and craft, which actually I don't either. Yeah. Um, and I think um, that's very true because I know that I, I mean, I sew most days yeah. for hours every day and it's something that I just don't tire of. It's mm. so, it is just, it's how I define myself, you know, and yeah. I, I find it really, actually if I wake up and I'm, I very rarely wake up and think, oh, I've got to sit there and sew. I usually, I'm like, yes, sewing. Yeah. You know, it's Which just. so lovely yeah, to wake up feeling like absolutely. that. You know, and I come down here and just really sort of am made up with my life, you know, mm. as, especially with the contrast of when I was younger. But I always found that, that there was solace sitting in front of a sewing machine or just sitting there hand sewing. Yeah. Even if you've just got 10 minutes to do something, there is something so therapeutic about it and yeah. you know i i just um it saved me completely i think mm -hmm. many times over you know and now i do something that i feel really proud of and you know I, you know i've met so many amazing people through doing this and mm -hmm. you know it's it's something that is, just means everything to me yeah and now of course you have a child of your own i do yeah. Uh, do you do you have any do you hold any guilt still or have you kind mm. of gone through that and and now you're focusing on what you can do in, mm. in your life? I think those things are because they're so preset at a very young age. They're always going to be, you know, like the dark little gremlins in the corner of your mind. They're always yeah. going to be there and they'll come out at really surprising moments. Mm. Um, so there is always a a, a thing of managing those yeah. things, those issues that can come up. I mean, I, I'm so self-aware now that I know the hows, the whys, the whens. Mm -hmm. I just think I, I had never expected to have children because I think of my childhood was so... Mm. Um, but I had my daughter and I was 26 when I had her. And I think it was sort of the... It was the thing that kind of consolidated everything. Mm. You know, um, I mean, I'm not a particularly baby maternal person. I'm not really, um, it wasn't really how I saw my life going, you know, fa you know, family and children and da 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 And yet you, now but, I, I know yeah. you as a mum. Yeah. It, it really yeah. suits you. Yeah. You know, she's been an incredible experience, you know, mm. and it's making me cry talking about oh. my daughter. But yeah, I'm d just so proud and... She's it's just, almost a, it's like another chapter though really because yeah. it, it's kind of saying this yeah. this was what motherhood was then yeah not quite maybe as I thought mm. this is motherhood now yeah and I get to rewrite that yeah with your yeah. mum she's a part of it absolutely and I think there is that thing of you don't need to I think so many people go forward and they're defined and they accept this is the set of circumstances, so I can't be any different. I can't raise, mm. rise above this. I can't rise above the council estate and the, yeah. that mentality. I can't rise above the poverty. I can't rise above... My parents were abusive, so I can't be... You know, there's, there's a lot of that. I think those messages often are very subconscious in people. Yeah. But I, for, you know, I, um, I refuse to be defined by those things. You mm. know, I, I do not want to be that sort of, you know cliche I feel so mm. blessed in my life you know because all of those things have formed me they're not yeah. things some of the things that I've seen and have happened I wouldn't wish on anyone but I wouldn't change them for myself mm. and you know my relationship with my daughter is so good you know I've been a single parent really with her yeah and you know we I, it's just full of warmth and laughter and mm. you know she's really into a lot of the same things that I am so so it's just been this wonderful experience for me and it's mm. it's made me realize that you can be flawed but you can you can still move forward you know mm. and you can you can make someone else's life better yeah. you don't have to re reenact the things that have happened you know I've yeah. I kind of took all of that and I've put it to one side and and this is where I've I've got to and I think you know um, my daughter's going to be 18 very very soon and and I think you know jobs are good and 
mm. you know, so I'm very proud. I, I think that's the amazing thing about you as well, the way that you see, uh, the way that you see the world, but also the way that you are able to go from having so much kind of emotional mm. stuff to deal with to to being, you know, when when I look at you, you're, you're balanced mm. and you're, mm. you know, you know yourself. Yeah. And yeah. it's really inspiring seeing what you're doing. Thank you. Because it's who you are. Yeah. And everybody that kind of comes into that gets mm. that same feeling. Yeah. So I, th yeah. I think it will really inspire a lot of people to hear where you've come from, but what you've yeah. created from I it. hope so. Because I think you, you learn from the people around you. And I, yeah. I think... You know, I'm so inspired, I've been so lucky with so many people that I've met and I feel so grateful for, you know, everything. You know, I am one of these really annoying people that is like, look at the sky, the sky is so beautiful, it's so lovely and, oh, I feel that grit, that's so... But it's those tiny little moments that are the sum of the whole, you know. Yep. And I'm, I'm, I do feel very blessed, you know, and part of that is putting good stuff out into the world you know and yeah. I do it by making things and helping someone have a, a great experience and you know feel really good in themselves and you know that relationship that you have with with clients that's a brilliant thing but then I collaborate with all these amazingly creative people so I feel so you know it's like when I was little looking at fashion magazines and I was like I want some of that that's amazing yeah. that is where I feel I am Mm. You know, and so I I just think that it's, you know, it's a, a great life. And that's all just through, you know, going with the, the thing that I love. Mm. You know, it wasn't about the money. It wasn't about anything else. It was just that I love putting bits of fabric together yeah. and stitching them. That's it, you know. But it goes to show that doing something that you love, mm. it, it might seem like a small thing, you know. It mm. might be cleaning. I mean, it's, yeah, you know, but yeah. doing that thing you love... Yeah, is exactly where you should be yeah. and will help other people to understand. It doesn't matter what you do, mm. as long as you're doing you yeah. and you're doing something that you love. I think so. And you're here fleetingly mm. and you owe it to yourself to have a pleasure that's true and not destructive. And if mm. that's, you know, I don't know, going to a salsa class or, you know, just going for walks or swimming or gardening or painting or making music, doing all of those things... You know, we, we put off so much. Yeah. You know, I don't think that's good. I think you should do do those things, but, you know, create some good stuff and put it out into the world and, mm. you know, create a bit of happiness. I think we owe that to ourselves and to everyone. Yeah.